So in this video we're going to take a look at profits. Investors like to buy firms that make profits, analysts talk about profits, newspapers, websites talk about hunting down firms with decent profit growth and potential, but actually let's ask in today's video a simple question. What exactly do you mean by profits? Very important, when a firm of directors says we are profitable, what does that actually mean? And the trick is to realize there, there are about four or five different ways a firm can make a profit. And it's important as an investor to know which is which. Okay, so let's lay out a simple profit and loss account. Now the profit and loss account appears in the annual financial statements about halfway through. It's one of the three primary statements and it's the one you hit first. So it's in front of the so-called balance sheet and the cash flow statement. So let's take a very simple profit and loss account. I'm going to simplify it slightly and see how many different ways there are to talk about profit. Okay, so the first figure in the profit and loss account, right at the top, is sales. And uh, I'll use some fictitious numbers to keep it nice and simple so we can focus on the jargon. Um, so sales or turnover, let's say 100 pounds or just 100. Right, that's not a profit figure, that's just what does the company sell. Vital, because if you sell nothing, you can't make any profits. So the sales figure matters, but the first profit figure is a little bit further down. Next, what is it costing us to make those sales? Uh, people who put accounts together talk about the cost of sales. So in a profit and loss account, the sales figure is a nice, big, positive number at the top. And just below it, there's a deduction for what are called cost of sales. Now let's say here, that's 60. Meaning, if we take that away, that the balance is 40. Now, cost of sales. That's the direct cost of making sales. So at a magazine, for example, that would be things like your publishing costs and your print and packaging costs. In other words, the costs that vary with sales. If you're not selling any magazines, you don't print them. Some costs don't vary with sales. Light, electricity and staff salaries. You have to pay those anyway. But cost of sales captures the costs that do vary with sales, sometimes known as variable costs. And here's our first profit figure. On the back of an envelope, a trader would say, if I sell something for 100 and the direct cost of selling it at 60, my gross profit is 40. So there's the first profit figure. If a board of directors talk about gross profit, they mean the profit that the company makes from sales minus direct cost of sales. So for Tesco, what you sell your sandwiches for minus the cost of the sandwiches themselves in a nice little packet from a supplier. So, gross profit, 40. And sometimes you'll hear people talk about the gross margin and they'll give a percentage. And just out of interest, that is the margin or the gross margin is simply that number, 40, over that one, 100, as a percentage. So you could say our gross margin is 40%, which sounds pretty healthy. You'd be happy with that. Um, so every time you make a sale, you're getting a 40% profit margin on it, except that there's something missing. In fact, there's quite a lot missing. What about overheads? What about the fact that if you're Tesco selling sandwiches, it doesn't just cost you a packet of sandwiches from a supplier to be able to make a sale? What about staff costs? What about the buildings you're in? What about electricity, gas? Well, they come in as what some accountants call overheads. I'm going to call them operating costs. And let's make those 10. So the result, if we're keeping this running total of our profit, is 30. And that's called an operating profit. And indeed, if you wanted to, you could talk about an operating profit margin, this time 30 over 100, so the operating profit over the sales figure as a percentage, so the margin here has dropped 
to 30%. And the difference between that margin, the gross margin, and this one, the operating profit margin, is whatever these are, operating costs, overheads. And those are important. Um, as a business, as a supermarket, you can't ignore them. So a lot of analysts think this is a better number. The gross margin's fine, but actually a more comprehensive view of how profitable the business is is operating profit or the operating margin. And watch out for this. Um, analysts and commentators have different words for the same number. So for example, if you've ever seen uh, PBIT or EBIT, is that number. Um, that's profit before interest and tax, because actually we haven't deducted any financing costs yet for the loans that are paying for this business, and we haven't taken off the tax charge yet either. Or earnings before interest and tax. So if an analyst says PBIT or EBIT, or the PBIT or EBIT margin, they mean this. So quite a useful figure. Um, in the food retail sector, analysts watch that like a hawk. It would only be five, six, at a pinch, 7% so is much lower than this number. And if it changes, analysts get very jumpy about what's going to happen to overall profitability for that kind of business. So that's a fairly key number, but it's not the end of the story. What about interest charges? What about the fact that this business may have loans outstanding and those have got to be paid for? So let's make those five. Bringing our total down to 25. And what about tax? Companies pay tax on their profits. The rate varies depending on how big they are. Small companies pay a little bit less than large ones, obviously. And that could account for, let's say, another five of those profits, bringing us down to, let's say, 20. Now, um, again, when you're saying what is profit, it is possible to put a name on the 25 there and the 20 there. Not surprisingly, if the 5 is tax, the 25 is known as profit before tax, very often shortened to PBT, and the one after tax is known as profit after tax. And that is the profit figure that's used in earnings per share calculations normally. So. Um, the net profit margin, net because it's after virtually all costs, including financing charges and tax, is not quite as impressive. It's not bad. It's more like 20%. And if you were doing an earnings per share calculation, you would take the earnings for the year 20, divide by the number of shares in issue, and that would give you your earnings per share figure. So, Profit after tax is also quite an important number, and it's quite often used in other calculations. Now, there's one more line to go. Dividends. So the directors know that for the last 12 months, they've made a profit of 20. After direct, indirect costs, interest and tax, they might decide to share that out with external shareholders. So there will be a line somewhere near the bottom for dividends. Now, how much of this 20 they pay out and how much they keep back and retain in the business for investment is up to the directors. But maybe they decide to pay out, let's say, half the profit for the year. And then accountants call the balance quite often what's been retained or the retained profits. So there's yet another profit figure, the amount that's been kept back in the business to be invested in future years. And actually, people would look at this and start to say, well, OK, this looks like the directors are paying out half the profit after tax as dividends. So in that case, the so-called payout ratio, that's the amount of profits paid out as a dividend, rather than being kept back in the business, is half, or 50%. And if you're an income investor looking for regular income, that's quite important because you want a firm that pays out a decent proportion of its profits each year. If this is you know, close to zero, then maybe you're looking in the wrong place. So 
The conclusion from all this is there are a number of different profit figures. If a company says we make profits of or our margin is, you need to understand which number they're talking about. Did they just say the gross margin? That's up here. Did they talk about the operating profit margin? That's pretty key. The EBIT or PBIT margin? Or are they talking about the net figure after interest and tax? And there's one more. There's one particular figure that analysts love to use. It's called EBIT DAR. What's the DAR? What's going on there? Well, it sounds like some version of this number. So it's the operating profit figure. But what's happened? So if you ever hear someone talking about EBIT DAR, the D and the A, so earnings before interest and tax, and two other things, before depreciation and amortization. Now, depreciation and amortization, in a nutshell, are costs buried in here normally that reflect the wearing out of a company's assets. In other words, if I buy a delivery van, for example, as a company, and I think I can make sales from it for 10 years before it collapses in a heap, I might choose to write off one-tenth of its original cost each year through the profit and loss account. The reason for not writing off the entire cost in year one is because I can still use the van to generate sales for another nine years. So accountants, quite keen on this idea of matching costs and revenues, prefer it if you take something like a van, divide its cost over, say, 10 years, and then charge each year's profits with a tenth of the cost of the van. That's known as depreciation. When you do it to an intangible asset like a brand name or a patent or a license to draw for oil or something like that, it's called an amortization charge. And some analysts think it's a bit dodgy, and I can understand their reasoning. So you're telling me the directors are allowed to simply decide how long their assets last, create a charge against profits to reflect that, which essentially is down to their judgment. And the answer is yes. So some analysts prefer to have the operating profit figure, EBIT, stated before depreciation and amortization. In other words, they add back the amount they think the company is charged for those two items. And that then becomes what some analysts think is a more reliable profit figure. It's closer to something cash-based. It's got fewer subjective, almost slightly dubious sounding charges included within it. And most importantly, it's before you worry about tax policy, which frankly is nothing to do with operating a business, it's more about tax rules, and interest on debt, which again you could say the interest I pay on debt doesn't have a whole lot to do with the nuts and bolts of my business, it just reflects a decision I made about whether I took out a loan to pay for the business in the first place or maybe went to shareholders for capital. So EBITDA, not perfect, but it's a profit number to watch out for.